Good morning, and welcome from all around the world to Structural Heart Life Cases, broadcasting from the Cardiac Cath Lab from Mount Sinai Hospital, New York City. I'm Dr. Gilbert Tang, the Structural Heart Program Surgical Director, and your moderator this morning. The video of this broadcast will be available on the website later today. The last broadcast from January 15th and all the previous structural heart cases are now available on www.ccclivecases.org. We would love to hear from you, so please send us your questions to ccclivecases at gmail.com, and we will answer them during the broadcast. We have a great case for you this morning, and let me take you now to the cath lab on Mount Sinai Hospital for the live case. Good morning, team. All right, good morning, good morning. Gilbert, and of course our viewers of the structure uh, the live cases. <laughs> and uh, this is again uh, actually back to back. In January also, we had a valve and valve case where we used the Evolute. And uh, today we have the valve and valve case, we are going to use the Sapien 3. And with that uh, note, I want to introduce my faculty here on right side, Dr. Keeney, then Dr. Uh, Jason Kovacic, then we have our fellow, Dr. Mohammad Khan, and our surgeon, uh, Dr. Uh, Farjan Phil Sufi. So with that note, uh, as you know, all require uh, many days of preparation, so we are ready for this very interesting case. And there has been a question about, uh, uh, about uh, the using the sapien valve for the purpose of the valve and valve, and I'll say, share the data. And in this particular case, that's why we selected. Then we have our, uh, uh, on the echo, Dr. Stem Larakas. And, and the anesthesia, we have uh, Dr. Minakam Wiener, yes. who is uh, right behind us. Sir. So this Can particular case, Minakam, it's a uh, intubation, or how are we doing this case today? OK. Because of the T guided, this case is intubated, as you know, the conscious no, sedation. Conscious sedation. Conscious sedation. No intubation. Okay. No. So about 90 plus percent of cases are done with a conscious sedation. Okay. With that note, quickly we go to the slides uh, and uh, start with the, uh, these are our supporters. <coughs> Next. Next. Yeah. This patient is a 79 year old. No. Go back to the slide, please. Back. Good. Uh, 79 year old patient uh, has uh, class 3 dyspnea on exertion. Patient has a bental in 2011 uh, for uh, bicuspid aortic stenosis and dilated ascending aorta. Was done right here at Mount Sinai, actually by Dr. Phil Sufi, who is participating today as a surgeon. Uh, in this particular case, with a 25 millimeter Carpentier Edwards uh, pericardial valve, Perimount 2700 inside a 30 millimeter hemisphere tube. So clearly it's a narrowed aorta, aorta compared to our usual one. And of course, patient has been AFib, has been ablated, and uh, still remains in AFib and as a pacemaker, uh, and a good medical therapy, non-obstructive CAD. And let's take it us to the echo. All right, this is the echo showing low ejection fraction of 35%. And the stem, comment yes. on your echo now. Yes, so as you can see, uh, right now uh, we are showing can the... Can you show the live echo? Yeah, and show yes, the live please. echo now. Yeah. Not the slide, live mm -hmm. echo. Good. Okay, so you can appreciate the struts of the prosthesis, of the aortic prosthesis. As you can see, the leaflets open well but are thickened. And you can appreciate that there's a flail, uh, one of the leaflets is flail, the non-coronary uh, leaflet is flail. <laughs> and uh, when you put the color on, you can see that's uh, what's the cause of the severe, actually moderate to severe uh, aortic regurgitation, valvular aortic regurgitation, because it's very important to make sure that it's not paravalvular. In this case, it's all valvular aortic regurgitation because of a flail uh, leaflet due to degeneration of the bioprosthesis. And you can appreciate also the graft on the proximal aorta uh, from the pedal procedure. Okay. And how is the ejection fraction? Ejection fraction is about 35%. Okay. Now, uh, uh, the Farjan, yes. this is about eight years since the surgery. You think it's not a little too soon uh, to have such a degeneration and it's more of a regurgitation rather than a stenosis? Yeah, I mean, I'm a little bit surprised too because this patient had this bipersthetic valve at the age of 71, I would say. Yep. And the freedom from reoperation at the age of 70 by the literature is about 70% at 15 years. Yeah. So it's a little bit too early. 
but depending uh, on calcification with prosthetic AS, uh, prosthetic AI is a little bit less with the tears that can uh, occur at the free edge of the lift leg, like in these patients or around commissural area. There is one hypothesis is that as we narrow the aorta, sometimes there is more pressure on the slifflets inside the tube and that you can create tears around the free margins because there is more pressure during the diastolic phase because the tube is not uh, expandable during uh, diastole. <coughs> Next slide. <coughs> this guy's oh, sleeping. Okay, we can go to the slides now. We have seen the line echo. Good. Good. So now we go to the CTA. Uh, yes, sir. Good. Good morning, everybody. So to take you through the CTA, a very careful planning. We know this is a 25 millimeter perimount valve, but we'd like to confirm all our measurements on CT. Uh, to make sure we're putting the correct valve in. So you can see there the annular plane approximately giving us a perimeter of 76 in an area of 454 with a mean diameter of 23.9, almost 24 millimeters. The LVOT, as you can see, basically gets significantly larger, uh, a lot larger than the, than the annulus. Next slide. Good. Key measurements here uh, is, is working out what our risk of coronary obstruction is and really these measurements are geared towards that. You can see the sinuses of Alsalva are fairly generous. Uh, we have a, a distance from the virtual the ostium of the left main and you can see the right bottom corner of about seven millimeters. So anything ab really above six, we have a low concern for left main occlusion. So the anatomy is quite generous and favorable here. We're not planning any left main protection or anything uh, from the coronaries for this specific anatomical reason. Next slide, please. Here you can see some coronary heights. Again, the coronary heights are quite generous. The STJ height generous. The STJ itself has a mean of 31. 0.8, uh, which is very accommodating for the size of valve we'll be putting in. The root angle is 43 degrees, so fairly benign. Ascending aorta is large. So very generous and accommodating anatomy for what we need to do this morning. Next slide. Access is uh, really nice. You can see large vessels free of calcium. A little bit of tortuosity. We went up and over in this case. It was a little bit challenging because of that steep angle of the aorteoiliac bifurcation, but otherwise very benign anatomy. Next slide. Good, and here you can see we're, we're checking for appropriateness for sentinel. You can see here the uh, innominate artery, the left carotid, free of calcification and favorable for a sentinel device. Next slide. Do you want, yeah. So, so here you can see, this is what we're, we're um, deploying into, this perimount 2700, 25 millimeter. You can see the stent internal diameter is 24, and that's an important measurement for if we're thinking about fracturing this valve. The height is 17 millimeters, and you can see there on the right side how this valve appears, how we should be looking uh, pre-deployment when we're just positioning the valve, and how our final implant should look of this valve. So these are all key so that we know how to position the valve and accommodate for the foreshortening of this valve that will occur as we inflate the balloon and deploy. And you can see here the sizing chart is appropriate for a 26 millimeter S3 and that's confirmed also by our CT sizing which gave us an area of 454 which is appropriate for S326. Next slide. And remember the question always comes uh, that being a supraannular using the, the core valve or self-expanding evolute and core gives you better orifice in this valve and valve. So also, the, there are enough data now for the balloon expandable also, and this is what the region to present this case uh, today uh, compared to the valve and valve with the core uh, evolute we did uh, in January. So basically what you need to do is to look at the uh, effective of aortic orifice area. So clearly we know the uh, patient prosthetic mismatch, anything less than 0.85 uh, really concerning. And uh, so it basically 26 millimeter sapien valve gets to about your 0.82 mm -hmm. centimeter per meter square, which is in vivo and vitro is 1.1. So I probably, may, who knows, it may land up about 0.9. So it is less of a concern. So key is, we also know, next slide, that is all dependent on the 
valves overall while the valve in valve tower looks better than native valve next the it's all dependent on the valve sizing so balloon expandable or self expanding what is the residual gradient is based on whether you're using a 20 millimeter or 20 to 20 uh, 23 millimeter or, or, or 29 millimeter or larger so clearly once you lose, use a larger valve your gradient decreases and this is where also comes down sometimes you have the valve which has a the net the original valve surgical valve has a very narrow uh, ring and you can fracture it to accommodate the bigger uh, to transcatheter heart valve and that is the technique which hopefully will show in this particular case if necessary and that is dependent on the, on the residual gradient. If it is more than 20, you go after because studies have shown that when you put valve in valve, residual more than 20 millimeter gradient occurs in almost 25% of cases and much higher in once your valve, uh, the tower valve is between 20 and 23. It of course decreases once it gets to 29 and above, becomes less than 5. Next. So this is basically summary of the case. We are ready in this particular case. Uh, with being a high risk, uh, plan is to use valve and valve tower with 26 millimeter sapient 3 uh, and a bioprosthetic valve fracture technique via left percutaneous femoral approach with central cerebral protection device. So you start now. They have already done. Uh, just, just show the, the fluoroscopy, please. Yeah. And I'll show you what we've done already. So the minor axis is on the right side, uh, very clean vessels as we saw on the CT. We're just getting our, our annular planes. You can see here we've got two posts overlapping on the right upper margin. This is almost a straight AP shot here. So if the valve aligns across this nicely when we come bring the S3, this will probably be the angle we deploy in. We always like to find alternate views. This is a, a fairly steep LAO crany okay. shot. You can see where we've got the three cusps aligned. Uh, we then went up and over. You can see us uh, going up and over here, crossing from the right over to the left. You can see there, that's the left iliac we're defining. We've uh, gone up and over with an 018 wire, taking the left, that's our <coughs> access point. Sheath is uh, inserted. We put in the 14 French E sheath, fully heparinized the patient. And now we're uh, putting the filter device in. You can see here our deep state shot, nicely defining the anominate and left carotid. And here you can see uh, a wire went into these small branches, but here you can see us fully deployed with the two baskets of the filter uh, on the on the right side of your left side of your screen sky in the anominate, the right side in the left carotid. And that brings us up to where we are. This is another view, Ario Cordal. Sure. Dr. Kinney. All right, we're ready to um, cross now. Yeah, the lights the down. Yep. This is the AR. Actually, when you have to go through the prosthetic valve, we use a AR1. You still have a pigtail here? Yeah. This is AR2, right? Yeah. yeah give me an AR1. Hmm? AR1. And same thing that if you're crossing the native valve, you would like to be on the LA view. But for the prosthetic valve, we'll show you how to do the crossing would be in the RAO view. Now, Gilbert, you can talk about a little bit uh, on various uh, of these valve fracture. So I know that not all of them, which I'll share later, uh, we can do. But what about uh, this uh, Carpentier Edward, this uh, Perimount? Yeah, so there have been a couple of papers looking at both bench top and, uh, you know, clinical experience on the uh, valve in valve fracturing. And of course, there's a discussion whether you fracture before or afterwards. Uh, there's certainly trade-offs between one versus the other. If you fracture before, you could cause uh, severe AI and have to put in the valve quickly. If you fracture afterwards, uh, you know, it's a little bit safer, but certainly there could be a risk of injuring the leaflet as well. But Paramount and the, the Carponte Edwards platform, Paramount Magna uh, are the ones that actually can be fracturable. The more common valves that can be fractured or have been fractured would Mitral. be the mitral flow valve, which has been known to degenerate a little more quickly based on the current data and also a bit more uh, challenging in terms of the uh, prosthesis patient mismatch and the residual gradient. So uh, Carponte Edwards in this case, uh, we'll see what it looks like uh, with the residual gradient, but certainly most of the ones that have been fractured are the smaller, about 19 or 21. Yeah. This is a 25 valve, so it's pretty generous. So let's see uh, what we got after we deployed the valve. And also I think one thing to note compared to a self-expanding valve, versus a uh, balloon expandable valve is that because it's balloon expandable, we've seen some cases where when we deploy the balloon expandable valve, 
the surgical valve frame actually stretches. It stretches yeah. uh, larger. So that could potentially improve the uh, effective orifice area as well compared to a self-expanding valve where you can mm -hmm. expand uh, with a post adaptation, but because of the recoil, there's uh, some a bit of the difference between the expansion after the valve is, uh, the transcatheter valve is placed. Good. So we are crossed now. Um, yeah, now I think they can focus on the hands here yeah. now. Good. So you see that was in the RAO view and just what you do is keep, uh, you know, rotating the tip of the AR1 in multiple planes so that you will, so you can show, I think you have seen the technique that was used to cross the valve here now. So what I'll do is go with the exchange length wire and change <coughs> to a pigtail. These wires are <laughs> useless. So once we have the pigtail, then we will uh, change to the confida wire. So clearly, uh, with a smaller root, uh, particularly a patient like uh, this, uh, with the bantal, going with the AR1 is the best choice because that others will give you trouble and more difficulty in uh, crossing. Actually, nobody thought about this uh, various valve, uh, I mean various catheter and the wire for crossing the uh, aortic valve. Actually, that was my first randomized trial as an attending. We did three-center trial of... Uh, aortic stenosis, uh, comparing the conventional, uh, the wire which you used to use a single core, uh, compared to the Tarumo. Okay, so here yeah. we are, get the gradient. Yeah, we saw a gradient earlier. Nothing. Yeah, it's oh, more of AI. More yeah. AI. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Good. Okay, the valve so is going, ready. Going up, uh, ACT? <coughs> it was 380. Okay, ACT is 380. And right now we are going with the Confida wire. Okay. So one thing that's this well. particular mm. different about this case is a patient of prosthetic AI. So often yeah. mm. when you put a stiff wire across, you can cause AI. <laughs> so patient mm. with severe stenosis, uh, you know, behave quite differently from patient with severe AI. So this patient probably will be a little bit more to better tolerating this condition than someone with prosthetic AS. Uh, so if you have prosthetic AS and suddenly you have more AI from the stiff leaflet, and stiff wire, you would want to move quickly to put the valve in before the patient could potentially be compromised. Okay. Okay, so before going in, we have to make sure our valve orientation is okay. The skirt is facing down. Mm -hmm. So the implanter, the first implanter and the surgeon has to confirm. So once you are confirmed, we are going in. And this is still the Sapien uh, 3, not yeah. the Ultra, because Sapien 3 still re will require adjustment. Uh, an ultra which is will be available freely in next few months right now being tested at few centers uh, will just will not require any f adjustment uh, um, in the descending aorta here you have to adjust okay so essentially you'll have one person holding the wire jk is holding the wire he's advancing the wire so i'll start bringing the balloon back you see that you keep pulling back you see the white marker then you lock it then you rotate with the small wheel so you can bring the balloon markers completely in until the dot is inside you just readjust again now what you need to do is make sure your adverse is facing up with the larger wheel okay you want to come to the front now or okay. you want to uh, okay. Dilate. What do you want to do? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. We are going to flex. Completely flex the catheter as you're going across the arch. And of course, you always have to see. Pay attention to the sentinel. Sentinel, yeah. Completely flex. This is the nice no-touch technique here. Once you are inside the valve, which is very good, unflex a little bit. And then you have to pull the hypo tube back, so you are exposing the balloon again. 
come to the center mark lock it and now we are ready to test position looks good right? position looks huh? doesn't look too bad i mean there is some low parallax on the, uh, the valve parallax. itself yeah. so uh, don't you think i'd pull back a little bit yeah, let's yeah i think that's, that's good now we are good yeah so Agreed? remember if it was yeah. shown from the base right so and it's going to yeah. expand so yeah, if you little, remember little it might in. yeah maybe a little, a little touch ventricular in. maybe Push go in, in nine ventricular yep Touch ventricular, yeah. not much okay. more. Okay, good. I'm using the, the fine wave. moment wheel. No, no, you don't need yeah. the picture. Yeah. Uh -huh. I think we are good now. No? I would. Okay, so Cine so without die. Yeah, okay, hold I'm on. with you. But you get I to the pacemaker rate. Right. Yeah, looks okay. like a little nice. bit. When uh, need to be go a little bit ventricular. Just a, just a I couple agree. millimeters. Go in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. Okay, I think we can use a fine <clears> adjustment, like you said, to. That's what I'm doing. That's the nice okay, feature of the safety yeah, free good. system. Good, 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 That's good. better. Yeah, per perfect. Okay, now 180 pacing. So this is a testing run. Okay, we want to make sure the blood pressure is uh, close to less than 50. That's nice. Didn't move. Okay. I yes. Think, I think that could almost come up. That could almost yeah. come up a little bit, Gilbert. Now. Yeah. Yeah. It's just a half a dot. Did you say off pacer. Sure. No. Off pacer. Okay, I'm coming back. The rationale to put a little nice, bit more nice, aortic nice. is yeah. to yeah. Uh, is to optimize the hemodynamics. I think that's the yeah. that's the yep. rationale. This looks good to me. That's why it I dropped in a little when we paced. Yeah. That's okay. That's so good. I think this time I'll, I'm going up. Okay. Yeah. 180. Hmm. And just for the audience out there, we do a very slow Keep deployment holding. and we do adjustment. We might have to push good. in a little bit. So the blood pressure it. is low enough. Okay, sis. Yep. Keep holding. Keep holding. Yep. Yes. Good. Now I go full. And okay, you can so see now my uh, seven. I'm right. full, full expansion at seven and eight. Okay, stop pacer. You can stop the pacing and I completely unflexed and come down. Very nice. Okay, good. So you can see the, the flaring of the outflow and it's that's what we would like to do to optimize the hemodynamics uh, with the sapien free valve in valve implantation. <clears throat> okay, let's see a little, uh, Manakam, little push in the Minakam, pressure. let's go up. A little bit. Okay, let's do the How little autogram. How does it look? Autogram, uh, no, here, I'm ready. Okay. Yes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm always ready. Echo? No AI, AI, no AI at all. Yeah. Nice. Can you give us any gradient yeah. there? Okay. Autogram first. Inject. Beautiful, Good. beautiful. Okay, so we come out. You can see how what high. Do you, think, Stan? you can just yes. see how high the coronaries are as we knew on CT. Yeah. No coronary trouble. No, at all. no AI at all. Good. I'm going to the. No deep, AI. Okay. No AI. I'm going let's to deep uh, gastric. Okay. Yeah, and let's do a hemodynamics yeah. to see the gradient across. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now, if we need to fracture it, what size of true balloon? Because you need a true balloon for this purpose. It would. It would be a 24. 24. Yeah. So that's one larger than the ID. Okay. Okay. Pigtail. <laughs> Give me the flush. We flushed. It's flushed. Flush it. You want? Yeah. So again, for the audience, if you have any questions, please feel free to email us at cccLiveCases at gmail dot com. Gmail? <laughs> I don't know. Email at gmail. I see. Okay. Right, Gilbert. Point. Yeah. I will measure okay. the gradient. You can you easily see it says the diastolic pressure much, much mm. higher than it was. Yeah. yeah that's a good uh, marker. And first thing you do after the valve, the diastolic pressure, and it's a good. That means your valve is in the right position, but without any uh, leakage. Beautiful. Wow. But by no gradient. Forget. Uh, hmm. All right. <laughs> By echo, by echo, the, the gradient. mean <laughs> gradient is three. Mean three. gradient three. Yeah. <coughs> so the question <laughs> is, if the gradient is less than ten, uh, there the is no reason to uh, fracture the valve. No, Maybe no, we already fractured it a little bit. Right? Uh, no. What do you say, uh, Gilbert? No need. Yeah, I think based on the uh, you know the geometry of the valve on and echo hemo? and hemo, I think we uh, we think that this is good, excellent result. And Go far, to some other thoughts. Yeah. 
I five. think it's perfect that you're having min grade on less than uh, 10 and, yeah. uh, you know, the, there's no AI, there is no residual AS. I think everything is fine. Yeah, I, I agree. Okay, I, far then. Yeah. Yeah, remember, there yeah. are anecdotal uh, stories about, you know, complications from fracturing. So if we can yeah. avoid it and with good hemodynamics, really, that's not necessary. Yeah, and here valve looks nicely expanded. So yeah. If you see also constrained frame, then maybe but the valve looks very nicely expanded here. Exactly, yeah. and this That's is great. one of the, the advantages of the Sapin Free platform with Malvin Valve that you can actually stretch open the Paramount yeah. frame. I think what we can do is uh, roll back and see the original Paramount frame geometry compared to now, and you can see the valve frame actually stretches mm -hmm. a bit. Mm -hmm. And uh, on floral, I think that's yeah. something that we can make a comparison with uh, during this case and, and for the audience to make note. Also, we now uh, have been, Zero. at least at Mount Sinai, doing more uh, post dilatation to expand the frame to improve the hemodynamics rather than, you know, fracturing because we feel that at least it's a bit safer than fracturing and we can, and we can get excellent hemodynamic results on either valve. Right. And Stam, uh, show the live echo now. Can we show the live echo all? Or yes, good? this is a uh, live echo. Good. There is no, there is maybe a trivial, trivial PVL, very small. The good. valve functions well. Wow. As okay, I told we you, the gradient is three. Okay, we almost uh, no, no gradient. gradient. Yeah. No gradient. Gradient of three, mean gradient by echo. Mean gradient of three. Gradient. Excellent. And the diastolic is 80. Yep. And we still have a catheter across. So yeah. My... yeah. Okay. Okay, Floral. we're ready to take the Floral. catheter one, across. One. Okay, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. No, this, good. yeah. Yeah. Nice. Okay. Okay, good. Yeah, yeah. So with yeah that Jason, note, can you show us the floral now? images? Yeah. Jason, can you show just go floral. back to floral yeah. images yeah. before yeah. we the deploy the valve yeah. and after? Yeah. I think you can yeah. see a visible yeah. difference yeah. of the frame so expansion. So let me just mag it up. So yeah. This, yeah. this would be... No, but he wants to go back to the other, other one So too. this is yeah. now. Yeah. This is now, and look at the before. And we can, I don't know if they can road map that. And before, is in this view, will be... Show the floral. There is going, going, going. No, no, no. I'm yeah, there. right there. No, no, before yeah, that. This, this, this one view. more. Yeah. There you go. The see? Yeah, yeah. This, uh, no. Sorry. Yeah, this view. Yeah. So you can see there's a difference in terms yeah. of the frame yep, yep. of the Paramount itself. Yeah. And mm. I think that's one of the advantages of using uh, the balloon expandable platform in valve in valve, you know, for the larger surgical valves. You want to do autogram one or no? No, no we're yeah. done. Okay, so with that That's note, right. uh, while uh, Jason is closing the femoral arteries and uh, uh, the any b b before we go to our uh, case discussion, uh, Farjan, from your point of view, uh, how would you have uh, any other thought in this kind of case? I think that's the right approach. I think for this these is the patients. right approach. Yeah. You know, this is a 79-year-old male who had a previous heart operation. The large which was implanted was 25 millimeters, so you can put also a large, you know, uh, Mag, yeah. uh, sepian three valves with excellent results that we see. I think this is the right oh, approach sorry, for thanks. this patient. Yeah, fix it. Okay, so now we can go back to our slides there. Mag out. Okay, so what I'm going to quickly talk about the tower versus sour valve durability, which had mm -hmm. been into Together. the equation and uh, yeah. a lot yeah, in the sure. media, in the press, in the journals, okay. everywhere, that what will happen to the tower yeah. valve compared yeah. to surgery, which has a time tested for last 40 years. Uh, and the second is the bioprosthetic valve fracture, little data on the bioprosthetic valve fracture. So next, so as we know, uh, the, all these valves, whether they are bioprosthetic, surgical valve, um, and uh, transcatheter valve all suffer from natural degeneration. And I mentioned earlier yeah. by Dr. <laughs> Phil Sufi, uh, Farjan, that uh, the, when the degeneration depends on when you implant the valve in the patient's age. Younger the patient age, higher the chance for uh, degeneration. So this particular case uh, kind of would have been about 12 years, minimum 12 to 13, minimum 12 years. and they he got like eight and a half years. Uh, next. And the, clearly, we know the various cycle, which I have shown it before uh, in the structural valve degeneration. And of course, what you do, uh, ultimately, uh, valve in valve or redo surgery. Next. Menachem. Now, you basically, stop, how you stop uh, define. So various definitions. I think the most people agree that if you increase in the mean gradient of more than 10 during follow-up or any time you have gradient of more than 20, along with or regurgitation of three, plus, three and above, will count as a structural valve deterioration or degeneration. This is where uh, many definitions are. Next. 
So this is what we used in most of the literature. Now we also show shown that five-year follow-up of the core valve and the partner, that valve is very stable, the gradient um, and the valve area remains constant up to five-year follow-up. Next. So what happens now? So we actually have the notion trial. Notion trial was the low-risk surgical cases with the STS of three and low. And they actually presented the first time we have data of the randomized comparison of the tower versus surgical valve uh, durability at six years. And they defined mean gradient more than 20, which I mentioned, or increase in mean gradient of 10 as a structural valve deterioration. Next. And you see here the valve durability. Looks good. Valve area is started with a 1.7 for the tower, was 1.5. Remember all these cases in the notion were core valve. And the surgical valve was 1.3, went down to 1.2 <clears> with a respective gradient. So remain good. Gradient and the valve area remains good. Next. So this is the key slide. So therefore, it is assurance in my opinion that if we just talk about the structural valve deterioration by definition of 20 or 10, it's a 24% occurred with a surgical valve and 4.8% occurred because of the, uh, in the tower valve. So big difference in favor of the tower. Next. And these are the various types of uh, valve degeneration, uh, what happened to these the patients, whether aortic regurgitation the and so and so forth. Next. But the key is that if you take after three months, still they remain in favor. You say, well, maybe some of them because there was a higher gradient at uh, time zero. But again, it still remain that there is a clearly higher structural valve deterioration. In this trial, at six, six year follow up in the surgery compared to tower. Next. But then the real one, that is, what about the valve failure, which require reintervention, surgery or valve in valve? That occurred 7.5% um, of cases in the tower and 6.7 for the surgical valve with a p-value of 0.89. So no difference. Next, which I put it together very nicely, the valve failure at six years. Now we can say, somebody asked us, what is the valve failure rate of the tower valve? I would say in the low risk is about six years, six percent at six years. And valve dysfunction definitely was higher with the surgery, but sure. valve failure was identical with the two valves. Next. So this is basically, they put it together, very nice um, uh, conclusion on the durability that they do go very well for the six years. Next. So then, uh, question is, this is the main, the which everybody has been eyeing for March 17th, uh, one just about a week, less than a week actually, where both the trial data of the partner three, which has a composite endpoint of all cause mortality, is stroke or rehospitalization at one year or the evolute, which is the mortality and stroke at two year, but they'll present one year data on, uh, on uh, March 17th, and we are all waiting for the final result of these low-risk trials. Next. And of course, all these will have a long-term data of the valve leaflet uh, subsidiary to see how much degeneration takes place, more specifically at the valve level. Next. And therefore, uh, the valve in valve implantation degenerated to surgical valve. Next. So we actually have the data up to uh, all different kinds of valve, uh, which behave better and so. Next. And the key is very important that what was the size of the valve, the surgical valve diameter. Is smaller the valve, more is the residual gradient. Very simple, simple principle. Like this case, has a 25 millimeter, so good valve. So very, even after whether you use a, uh, sapien valve or use core valve, your gradient will go down if your original valve was bigger. Next. And this is the point I said uh, in the valve in valve technique. Yeah, yeah, so have, the type of the valve, these, surgical yeah. valve versus uh, tower valve, all the residual gradient dependent on the valve size and valve diameter. Next. So, so key is the balloon valve fracture. Now what is the balloon valve fracture? Uh, at the time of valve and valve transcatheter aortic valve replacement. And this is basically is that the bioprosthetic valve fracture, BVF, is a new terminology, is an important emerging technique to address the high residual gradient following valve and valve tower. The aim is to intentionally fracture the bioprosthetic valve sewing ring using a high pressure balloon associated with an audible snap and sudden drop in the balloon inflation pressure. 
thereby increasing the potential expansion of the fixed surgical ring and final valve area achieved with tower. So clearly the valve increases, the gradient goes down and that actually shown. And the early work supports the safety and feasibility of the technique in a small number of patients, although there are limited data concerning the uh, relative change in the tower diameter and the residual transvalvular gradient at follow-up. Only question also remain, the should you do it before the tower or after? As uh, Gilbert mentioned earlier, many people do it before, but sometimes you can lacerate the uh, surgical valve leaflet and you have to rapidly put the tower. Or you do it after the tower, then you worry about what will happen to the leaflet in the long run, we do not know. So can be done both ways. Now, overall, some That's reports, it. handful cases have been done. There are some cases of annual rupture, but very small. And of course, the other thing you always worry about uh, in these patients, actually, uh, some of these may require even permanent pacemaker, which is very uh, not common otherwise. And of course, the coronary occlusion is uh, one of the factors we need to worry about. Next. So what has happened is the various valves of the aortic uh, position which they had looked into in the bench testing. Oh, and they had looked into most of the valves, 90% uh, plus percent of the valves clinically available. And it turns out to be that you can fracture most of the valves except the St. Jude's trifecta or the Medtronic Hancock II. Hmm. Do you know why uh, maybe a Gilbert or Farjan can say other valve can be fractured with a high pressure balloon dilatation, oh, but yeah. these are the two valves. They could not fracture on the bench testing Hancock as well as trifecta. Uh, Gilbert, any comment on this? Uh, I th well, I believe, uh, far as I'm correct, correct me if I'm wrong, oh. I think the tri trifecta is made of titanium, is that correct? Ah. Uh, the yeah, frame? I think it's okay. mostly the alloy that has been used in the consistency of the sewing ring. Ah. Yeah, so they cannot the be broken because of that reason. I think whereas if you look the Magna or the Magna mm. East or the Paramount there, they're more like plastic. Uh, so ah. it depends on what it's made of, I believe, uh, okay. ultimately, to allow you yeah. to fracture or not. Yes, yeah, so the titanium cannot be fractured and others can. And the biggest number apparently is the mitro flow. Uh, they say that 200,000 valves are, have been implanted. Yeah. Apparently, mitro flow is one of the most commonly used valve for this purpose. Next. And this is the way you see it. You see the dent? Yeah, and then you open it up, it's and dead. that, of course, uh, decrease the gradient uh, corresponding hemodynamics. Next. So key is, there's another, some paper, just paper came out uh, of the replacement and the bioprosthetic valve fracture, different transcathal heart valve design. Next, by John Webb Group. And they went through the whole process and a lot of bench testing and really understanding the mechanism. It basically turns out to be that you really fracture the ring. Mm, yeah. You really snap the ring. Next. And that lead to the improvement in the overall valve like area, the side. dimension, and decrease the in the side. gradient. Next. And they actually use both balloon expandable as well as self-expanding, Sapien versus uh, uh, one, the one. accurate Neo. Uh, and uh, found both of them working quite well in this uh, position. And of course, using a 19 or 21 millimeter mitre flow. Uh, those are the one way which are culprit, that they, those are the one you need to break uh, to increase the overall uh, effective aortic orifice. Next. So Sapien and Accurate Neo, they actually shown the pre-fracture after post-fracture uh, and pin wheeling index is the, basically they call it the twisting of the leaf, uh, leaflet redundancy and really uh, is a very effective way to measure the success besides having the gradient. Next. So it seems to be that the balloon, the bioprosthetic valve fracture performed after valve and valve tower results in improved residual gradient. Following BVF, residual gradients are similar irrespective of the transcatheter heart valve design. So whether it's a balloon expandable or self-extending. Use of a small accurate NEO for valve and valve tower in a small 21 millimeter surgical valve may be associated with the challenges achieving optimum THV position and expansion. So BVF could be considered in selected clinical cases. So this particular case, so although we advert, we had, when we did a e-blast, we did advise, um, advertise that we may do a balloon fracture and that has to be go with your residual gradient. If the gradient became less than 10 like this, it's absolutely not necessary. Rather, you'll risk this patient uh, for uh, problem, but if your gradient is in double digits, 15, 20, then you can think about fracturing these valves, but that can be done. Next. So the take home message next. So basically to put it together, the first randomized clinical data on comparative outcomes uh -huh. of valve durability at six years have shown 
lower structural valve deterioration with tower, valve versus surgical valve, overall valve failure, which is a degeneration sure requiring reintervention, we, 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 is about 5 to 7 percent at 6 years and is similar between two approaches. Mm. These data are very reassuring that we, when we start implanting tower in younger low risk AS patients. Next. And the selected degenerated bioprosthetic valves can safely undergo valve fracture technique, particularly the smaller one, 21, 23. I think 25 not needed like we just saw it today. 25, uh, your surgical valve, once you put a right good size, your tower valve, you would not need like this particular case. So to reduce residual gradient at the time of tower implantation before or after tower, which I said it's questionable, long-term results on the tower valve durability are awaited after valve fracture technique. Next, we go to our three questions. One, following is the true statement regarding comparative long-term durability of tower versus sour. One answer, tower valve has lower structural valve deterioration, surgical valve has lower structural valve deterioration, tower valve has lower valve failure, and surgical valve has lower valve failure. Next, and answer is A, that tower showed lower structural valve deterioration, while the valve failure rate was equal in both the uh, <coughs> studies. Next, I mean both the techniques. Then following is the incidence of aortic valve failure or degeneration after tower versus sour in the notion trial at 6 years was 5%, 6 to 8%, 9 to 10% or more than 10%. Next, we know it clearly that uh, it was between 6.8 to 7.5. Uh, correct answer is B. Next, the last question is the following are the true statement regarding the bioprosthetic valve fracture techniques except the BVF caused significant decrease in the residual gradient. BVF can be done with all types of bio SAVR. BVF is associated with very high complication rates and BVF can cause serious injury to the tower valve. So clearly, the basically is that uh, BV cannot be done with all kind of bio SAVR. We saw it, two of them cannot be done. With that note, we are done here. Answer. An answer? Yep. B. Okay. Now, Jason. Show the fluoroscopy. Show this the images, please, fluoroscopy. The fluoroscopy images, please. Fluoro. Fluoro. So, good. Just to take you through what we've done oh. while Dr. Shama was presenting, we're just showing you here the removal, removal of the cerebral protection device. First, we're retracting the distal filter into the device. The next step, uh, very easy and simple, I think. This is one of the beauties of this technique. We then prolapse the whole device into the aorta. You can see we now unflex it there. And then the next step is we just simply retract the whole device and the whole thing comes out. It takes about 15 seconds to retrieve. Very simple and very straightforward. From there, obviously, we're um, removing the access and closing the, the uh, access point. What we've done here is we have a catheter up to the aortoiliac bifurcation. We have an up and over wire and we also have the retrograde wire, the stiff wire going up the left side. We've retracted the E-sheath to the external iliac and taking a first DSA shot, you can see no problems in the common iliac. We then go up and over with that small sheath from the right side. Uh, and I'm just showing you something interesting here. We very, very rarely get entrapment of the 018 wire in the perclosed sutures. And that's exactly what happened today. You can see I'm trying to advance. It's actually a 90 balloon across the point where the perclosed sutures have grasped and the balloon is not going. So it's not a problem. This happens uh, maybe one in 50 cases. What we then do is we actually, you can see there clearly the balloon is not going at the perclosed sutures. We pull the retrograde wire, the 035 wire, in case they're entangled. Still the balloon is not going. So clearly we have the, v the 18 wire under the perclosed sutures. You can see what we very carefully do is we retract the 018 wire and then re-advance. And you can see immediately the balloon goes. Very straightforward. Very good, yeah. We then inflate the balloon, uh, nominal pressure, this is the four atmospheres, deploy the perclosed sutures, <laughs> final closure, looks great. Beautiful. Yeah. Okay. All right. Good job. Gilbert, we are done from our side. You uh, you concluded. Yes, thanks very much for a great case. So thank you again for the hard team members of the CAF Lab at Mount Sinai, and thank you for joining us today for this <coughs> exciting case. The recording of this case will be available later today, uh, archived on www.ccclivecases.org. Structural heart live cases occur every other month on Tuesday at 9 a.m. 
So our next case will be on Tuesday, May 14th. Thank you for joining us today and have a good day.